we can get started. Um, I'll throw out my, uh, well, maybe you guys should, do you guys have any questions, specific things that you wanted to cover? My theme for next week that I was thinking of is um, walk better, run better. And so it's a pretty broad topic. Um, the thing that makes me want to do that topic a lot is um, balance issues and flexibility issues in joints, like enough um, mobility in all joints to make those motions. Hello, Genevieve. Hello. Um, <laughs> um, obviously, I'm invested in having people run well. It's not only something I, mean, I like to run, but I also uh, end up observing a lot of people running very poorly. And it really bothers me. <laughs> we joke about the fact that I should just carry business cards around and drop them on the ground in front of people and have them, you know, and then go, oh, excuse me, did you drop this card? Oh, look, it's for physical therapy. Maybe you want to call. Maybe they can help you run. You know, I don't know. We joke about the fact that some people think you can just go out the door and run. And in all honesty, you can't just go out the door and run well. It really is a skill. And, um, but, but even if we take that to the walking level, there's a lot of people we have as clients who don't walk well. And Kim and I were talking about one of our clients who shuffles her feet a lot, right? And that puts them at really high risk for falling. Um, shuffling feet with, because they feel unsafe or unbalanced but then they actually, if they shuffle their feet, they're more likely to fall. And in fact, she did fall that one kind of, um, so, and really hurt her shoulders. So uh, what comes to mind for you guys when you think about walking well or running well or both? I, I can say for me, just because my clients tend to be a little bit older, um, I don't have as many runners, but I do see a lot of bad walkers and they all walk, especially right now because everything's shut down. Um, there, people are doing a lot more walking um, and biking. And um, I, I think back to the, the gait analysis and the gait work that we did. Um, and it would be, it's hard to put people in the right place um, a lot of them walk back on their heels. All their weight is in their low back and they kind of just sh kick their feet forward and they're way back here the whole time that they're walking. And then they wonder why their back hurts. Um, but it's, it would be helpful to have more um, cues and more ways to kind of, while they're, you know, you're working with them, um, give them things to remember when they're walking on their own like what what it should feel like where you know I always say like try to bring more weight into your toes so you're pushing off as opposed to staying you know kind of back like that um but it I, I think about that so for me it's more the walking than the running um yeah in what I'm working with yeah well the interesting thing is that walking and running is not so different posturally the difference is um, two feet on the ground at one time versus one foot on the ground at a single time. So strength wise, you need to have enough strength in running to have the knee and the ankle hip all landing without wobbling um, on the running that gets harder. Um, so that would be really the main difference, but posturally a good runner and a good walker have essentially the same posture. The runner may be slightly more inclined into the wind or slightly forward. But, um, and the heel strike, you walk with a heel strike, you don't run with a heel strike typically. So um, those are the two or the main differences. But as far as the posture is pretty much the same. So um, yes, and what you're talking about that leaning back, let me just throw this at you. Why do you think they end up walking so far leaning back? Any thoughts about that? Um. It's something really basic. I see it more in the men, actually, than the women for some reason. But uh, is it just based where they're keeping their um, the rib cage? Like if partly, but, but you far back. 
but no. yes so but even more so the reason they end up back there is because they're so afraid of falling it's ironic right you're afraid to fall when you're afraid to fall you are afraid to fall on your face okay the, so what you do is you take your body posture and you pull it backwards because that gets your face farther away from falling forward. Now, the truth is, if they're going to trip, we actually want them to trip going forward because then they have a chance to step forward and catch themselves. Yeah. If you start falling when you're leaning backward, you have very little chance of catching that fall. You're going to go back with your hands and then we have problems. Right. But if you like going upstairs, for example, is a really good way to think of it. I'd so much rather somebody fall on their face going up the stairs because they're falling into the stairs forward. Whereas the, the tendency for older people is to lean back and have to really hold the railings and try and pull themselves up with the railings because their trunk never gets forward over their hips. Their trunk is doing what you're saying, Alice, and getting back here too far back. But it would be so much safer for them to fall forward up the stairs than it would for them to fall backward down the stairs, right? So um, it's a lot of times it's here more than physical. So two, two main things to think about. I'm going to show you some fun walking postures. Let's see if I can demonstrate them well enough. I'll move back here. Okay. So if I, um, you've seen these, right? Yeah, some of you have seen me do these because they're just really funny, right? So here we've got um, the lean back here and I'm gonna walk like this. Yeah. So a lot of happening here and I'm in that, if I go back here to keep this back, then I can, I'm heel striking all the time and I end up with a shuffle, right? So now we're also, um, causing more chance of falling because I can't pick up my feet with myself so back. One of the others that you see sometimes is this marching kind of walk. The other one I see sometimes is this one. Right, very, um, if you can see that I'll come towards you. Mm -hmm. Right, there's this side to side to it. Um, and then another one, is this one. But you have, right. you're forgetting to look down exactly at the floor. <laughs> yes, right. In front of me, yeah. 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 Yes. And then the head was up like this, right? Okay, so, so uh, two of these, this one, right, and the sideways one, waddle one, a lot of times have to do with tight hip flexors. So, okay, wait, wait, let me backtrack. I'm gonna get, to get in a good walking posture, what I need is to go all the way up, right? I need to go all the way up. I need to have my weight more forward than backward, like you were saying, Allison, too. I need to have my knees uh, flexible enough so that when I walk, I walk and I don't go anywhere, right? I can stay, right over, and I will heel strike, but I'll roll through the foot. Yes, so I'm coming up and I'm staying up right here. So this is what we want. There's a lot of components. The one that I was just talking about, this one, and this waddle one, right? If I don't have enough hip flexor space, I, can, I cannot get my leg behind me in gait. So if you're seeing either one of those two, the waddle or this one, or the marching even, really three of them, chances are my hip flexors are tight or my quads are tight or both. So that's one thing that if without enough space in there, you're never gonna fix that walking posture. Right? So I would definitely go for that, hip flexors. The other thing with this posture, right? What is this posture? This one is that forward flexed, closed chest, tight thoracic, wow. right? So we need to look at what are pecs doing? Can pecs actually open enough? Can the person get themselves upright in their trunk? Or what happens when you try and do that? Get that head and chest upward. Um, so 
getting that position is really key. So then you want to think about thoracic shoulder blades, thoracic extension, opening that up. Um, and then what was my other one? So that covers the other thing to watch for is ankle mobility. So if somebody doesn't have enough ankle mobility, they can't get over the ankle here, right in that stride. So the gait gets really short. Yeah. Um, some people have the fused big toe. That makes them do maybe not want to push off so much with the toe and maybe do a spin or maybe do a little more sideways walking if they don't push off, if they can't push off the big toe. So those are things that we see that are really obvious in the older population, I would say, that you could just target right away with walking. Go back to posture, get their posture right, and then work on the tight, figure out which places are tight and you need to open those up and then give them enough strength to hold themselves upward, right? And then they'll actually get less dangerous. They'll get less likely to fall if we can get that upright. And the other thing is actually just purely working on balance. Can they balance long enough to um, get the other leg through without feeling like they're falling over, right? There's a moment in every walking gait where you're on one leg or on the other. So you ha they have to be able to balance long enough on the one leg that they're not falling to their feet and kind of bracing. And then you've, all, you've seen them all do this. They come in, they're holding on the wall. When there's a wall, they're holding the table. When there's a table, as they walk by, they're holding the poles of the Cadillac as they walk by. That's a really dangerous habit is that they need that much support and they're holding onto things. One of those things is not going to be stable enough to hold them. And could, they could fall because they're holding onto furniture that, or things that they're not aware are moving too. So it's not a great habit. So I usually, if that's the case, then maybe they need a cane or a walker because they're that nervous about walking around. So you can gauge and see where they are, but um, you could definitely work on all those things. The other thing that I like to work on, you guys know the runner's lunge exercise. It's a hard exercise, but you could have them holding on. I'll do it holding on to the wall right here. So they can come here and then they can work on going up and back, right? Can they come up this up forward, learning to be even doing just a calf raise, leaning into the wall forward, helps them understand this forward, the body plank, the upright. So this is a really nice exercise for them to work on. Then you could add the foot up and back. And up. we've done this with hands on the wall. We've also done it with TRX, right? Coming up and back, but you wanna be able to get hands against the wall or something so that they have something to hold on to, to do it. So up and back. So teaching them that forward posture, putting them in positions where they have to plank in a forward posture where it's not so overwhelmingly hard as planking on the floor. So it feels like it relates a lot more to standing posture. So um, does that help? Yeah. So I think um, for me, for this week, I'm gonna focus on things that typically get really tight with and, and disrupt good walking. So getting some ankle flexibility, getting some hip opening flexibility, getting the upper back open flexible, working on inner thigh connectedness and alignment of the knees. So that's a big one too. Also, um, and you could do that in squats or lunges or even just standing squeezing exercises um, with totally straight legs and partially bent legs again. Um, you can do balance work, single leg balance work. Um, you, and you can make it easy enough for people to hold, they can, have, they can hold on to something and do it just so they gain some confidence. Um, a lot of times with my older clients working on, I know Genevieve and Kim, you've done this too with some of our clients, is I have them do high marching walking while they're holding on to my hands or holding on to, you, they can do it at home in place, uh, holding on to a counter even, so high marching knees can really be helpful to work on the balance and give them the confidence that they can actually pick up a leg and not feel like they're gonna fall over. So I think those are the basic things. When it gets to 
runners, um, calf raises are always great. They need that calf strength. When it gets to runners, you want to think everything is pretty much the same, except a little bit more of. So the forward inclination has to be a little bit more of a forward inclination. The um, calf raises, they, they should be able to do single foot calf raises and keep their knee in alignment too with their foot and ankle because they're jumping, right? So then you want to look at them hopping and jumping and landing properly. Those are all really important exercises for runners are those things. Um, they need to have more quad strength. They need to have more glute strength. So it's, it's just more of, and they need to have hip flexibility, which I am shocked at how many runners do not have hip flexibility. And what, what happens to runners when their hips don't extend? They still have to have that extension. What happens? How do they get it? I think. From their back? Yes, lower back. Yeah. So instead of getting the extension moment at the hip, they end up keeping this tuck and they get the extension movement in the lower back. Yeah, so then they're landing and jarring and this is happening to get that extension for the leg to come up and through each time, which is really sad. <laughs> really, um, because that's gonna cause problems for sure. Maybe not for six months or eight months, but then it will. And then it's a hard habit to change, right? You gotta really then work on opening that. So I think, um, so that's kind of what I had in mind for them for this coming week. Gives a whole wide range of things to work on, um, but you, it's easy for you to relate it back to stance and posture and walking and running and getting them up um, into whatever, even, even if they're just walkers, right? It's a big deal for them to be able to walk safely. And like you said, Allison, now everybody's walking and running and hiking a lot more than they used to. They sold out of snowshoes in all of Switzerland. <laughs> you cannot buy them anywhere in Switzerland. That's the thing that happened here. Is everybody snowshoeing now all of a sudden? <laughs> so, you can't get a bicycle. Like if oh, you don't already okay. have one, um, they're all on back order everywhere you go. <laughs> so Craigslist is uh, getting hit up pretty well for that. But. Yeah. Yes. And and they bike and then they get really tight in their hip flexors or they're walking and they think they don't have to stretch after walking because it's just walking. <laughs> so I'm seeing a lot of people a lot tighter than I've ever seen them in the past yeah. too. Yeah. My favorite hip flexor stretch remains, well, Kim's doing that side quad stretch. So the sideline quad stretch and the prone quad stretch are my favorite. A lot of clients can't get prone, but then the so then the sideline one, if you can, if they can, uh, then I go to standing. But the Thomas stretch off the edge of the table yeah. is remains my favorite. Um, or the hips on the roller, the leg going down, remains my favorite hip flexor stretch because it just helps you get the hip flexor on the Thomas. When you get the hip flexor, you get the quad. And I've come, I've gone to stretching the quads with the hips on the roller like this to active. It's really active, so only the Stronger clients can really do it, I think. Sorry. But this and bringing the feet in really close to the bottom and then hollowing and almost almost lifting like coccyx curling them in. But that really helps open the hips and the quad. So I can get a good quad stretch here and it feels very supportive and safe. Um, so this is a nice way to do it uh, for people who are less flexible and but they need to have enough strength. So it, it's nice because you can be working strength and working stretch at the same time. The other lovely quad one, but this would have to be somebody young enough with flexible enough knees is doing this way. And then coming down and then trying to, oops, I lost my head. Right down. But yeah, trying to go this way, right? And then getting the quad on stretch like this, just hold it under. So this is really nice for your more, your younger, more flexible, your runners perhaps, but a great way to get the quads on stretch um, too. But prone is good too. And if they can't, either that standing. And I've actually just 
I was working with a client of mine virtually and I have her do the quad stretch and standing after doing some stair work. That's a great option too, actually, um, is stair work with older clients because that gives them strength. It also gives them the forward tilt of the body. When they have to go upstairs, they figure out that they can lean, fo that leaning forward really can help. So um, working on just even doing up downs on stairs. So step up, I don't have my block up here, sorry, but you could imagine step up, right? Uh, up to step and tap down and up a step and tap down without landing. That's great work for the body posture. Uh, the chest trunk body is all in good alignment and tap down, right? So I have to get in that forward position if I was gonna tap up and tap down and keep my weight on this leg so that I got my body forward. That's a great exercise for them. But then the quad stretch, I found that it, sometimes it's hard to get enough stretch just being here. But if I put my foot against the wall and scooch in, then I can sort of recreate what I did on the roller. I'm trying to drop the knee into the wall as much as I can. So I actually get a quite a nice quad stretch here, even for myself. So this is, if you haven't tried this, it's my new favorite way. It's a lot easier than doing it on the roller. So, and it doesn't require having to get back down on the ground and lie down for people who struggle already to get up and down from the floor. Um, so that's kind of been a new little discovery for me about stretching the quads. So, yes, we have a whole list <laughs> of great things to do. That quad stretch that you just demonstrated against the wall, um, if you've got a client with knee injuries, would you stay away from that one or is it safe? You could do it. You just wouldn't be as close to the wall, right? So if, if I had a knee injury, I could do it, but I would probably stay further away from the wall, maybe put the foot against the wall, the back of the foot, and then see if I can get the foot up here. And you don't have to compress as much as I did. You can decide how much compression and you can decide how much flexion. So I can, I can take this back and really compress, but I don't have to. It's really similar to holding the ankle, but somehow with the foot there, I don't have to worry. And I can think about what my butt is doing and what my tummy is doing to get more stretch. But I don't feel any pressure in the knee uh, when I do this one. Okay. Uh, so it's really kind of nice, actually. Yeah. What about this one for hip flexor? Yeah, so that can work also for hip flexor. The thing about that is it's, well, this was more quad. That is more hip flexor. But remember the difference between hip flexor and rectus femoris. Right, so if we want to isolate psoas, we have to take rectus femoris out of stretch, which means straightening the back knee. Okay. So if you can do a combination stretch, if you're not particular about, if you're not being particular at that moment about which muscle you're stretching, but just keep in mind that with a knee bent, rectus femoris is a bit on stretch more than psoas, so you may not get enough psoas okay. if the knee is bent behind. So just keep that in mind. Right, because of the two joint versus the single joint muscle of psoas being, so as we're calling it single joint at the hip, rectus crosses hip and knee. Yeah, so just keep that in mind. And, and sometimes that's a fine thing to do is to stretch both at once because they're just so tight all along. But sometimes you need to isolate psoas. Yeah. Yeah, go Genevieve. Um, this is, more of a gate question. Um, I was working for a little while with my old housemate who he's, he's very large. Um, he's, you know, probably considered obese. Um, and I was kind of working with him cause he's, you know, back pain and all that, that kind of goes along with it. Um, and I was looking at his, his gate and he's one of those, you know, Side. I think because of the, 
a there's some hip flexor tightness there but also i think because his legs are so big you know he kind of has to shift his weight from side to side to to make that work um so i was just curious about your how you would address that knowing that walking is a good way to start losing weight <laughs> but also that that causes pain um especially if he's not walking properly. Is he in pain already? Uh, yeah, and it's- other The back, but other it's, than- yeah, it's, it's that, you know, sitting oh, back, wow. he's got, you know, he's got to put the weight somewhere. Um, and, yeah. and we've worked and, and we've, you know, talked about getting him up out of his sitting posture back here. Um, and that's been helpful for him, which is good, but, um, I was just curious about, about that walking bit of it. Yeah. Um, so if things were normal time, normal time, you might tell him walk in the water to right. start getting moving or maybe even spinning on a bike if that was accessible because to get some of the weight down before you try and the truth of the matter is with people who are larger so if they a lot of times if they lose a considerable amount of weight and come into a normal weight range the pain goes away it's just that they're overloaded so movement is really a big huge key like your th your thinking is absolutely right the question is how now to get somebody like that moving enough without hurting so much um, yeah that, so that, and friction in the thighs comes into play with the the cycle right so it, it would yeah so I think um and a lot of times if you're quite heavy sitting on a bike saddle is really hard because there's just too much weight on the saddle yeah so um you know it in absence of being able to get in the water I would say maybe thinking about a support brace or something at the back and then have them walk um, and just really gradually build on to the walking. And at the same time, maybe even doing things like wall sits or wall squats, things like that that are active that can actually, if you did enough of it, the heart rate would start going up. Things that would elevate heart rate, but give him support at the same. So the reformer is perfect for that um, because that's the leg press that would be like if they had access, right? A reformer is a great idea. Even if you're doing it wide second position and just going back and forth for 15 minutes in different positions on a reformer is a great way to start moving someone who's having a hard time. And then trying to apply that into just a walking, starting with five minutes. And, and uh, sometimes to leave, because what happens is it's the amount of time of walking after like they can walk for a few minutes and be okay, but when they walk for too long, which is not that long, 15 minutes, they have pain already. So sometimes doing four, five minute walks in a day, they stay pain free in five minutes, but four or five minute walks still does something. Mm -hmm. So um, it could be starting off with something that simple for someone who's been inactive. Um, and, and then build from there. And then those four or five minute walks, then they can be four or seven minute walks. And then you can have one 10 minute walk and one seven minute walk. And mm -hmm. like things that can start slowly combining as the weight starts to come off and as they get a little stronger. around. Right. So I think trying to find ways to work around the discomfort mm -hmm. is, is good. And sometimes the short duration of things or the wall sits or a reformer or roller against the wall, rolling up and down in little, little tiny squats, even just small squats. Yeah. Something to get motion, having them um, stand, uh, get out of their chair like 15 times a day, maybe uh, six times an hour, every 10 minutes, they're getting up and down from their chair. Even that is creating more activity, creating more blood flow and it, and at that, when people are really large, it's, it's not that hard to add activity that actually makes a difference. So um, it could be little things. I'll spread yeah. out. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. And, and also just thinking about that, um, like incremental walking, um, 
would that be a good way to transition somebody from say walking to running? Like yeah. doing, you know, oh, oh, he's getting your, your stamina up for walking and then, and also the, the muscular stamina um, and then doing shorter, shorter burst runs, sort of that walk, run, walk, run, or like short run and then like chunk of your day and then short run. Yeah, good question. Okay, so um, uh, here's my blurb on running. <laughs> running hurts, period. Running hurts. If you haven't been running, it's going to hurt. So uh, the, the way that you make it hurt the least that I have figured out and that I think most of the research supports it is um, walk, run, walk, run. So go out for, say you're going to do a 15-minute segment uh, only. Right, so starting with very short things, um, depending on the walking tolerance of the person at the time, right, that would determine where you would start with time-wise. But you take that walking tolerance um, of 30 minutes. Say it's a walking tolerance, I can walk for 30 minutes, no pain on flat. Great, that's a great starting place, but I wanna be able to run for 30 minutes. So what you would do is you take that 30 minute, that's the length of time, the first five minutes are walking and kind of brisk pace walking to warm up the body. And then you start doing one minute jog, one minute walk. And you do maybe three cycles of that. And then you walk and then you do that set three times again at the end. One minute walk, one minute uh, jog, one minute walk, one minute jog. So the last six minutes are doing that. And after the first five minutes, you have six minutes of that and the rest of the time you're walking. Right. And then you start to you keep that 30 minute block and you start to add more interval, one minute run intervals till you have like 10 minutes of running or 15 minutes of running in there. And then you start taking it into longer runs so within that 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So you're keeping that for, for your set because you know that that was an okay walk. So at any time, if things go wrong, they can stop running and just walk and they should be fine, right? So we shouldn't be flaring something up hugely uh, by if we keep them in that parameter. And then, and then things start to blend in that parameter and soon enough they're running 20 minutes in a row. And then you can talk about, okay, do you wanna, is this 30 minutes, how, is this our target or do we have a bigger target? And what does that target look like and how do we work our way up to that target? Mm. But if anybody was going to go, even to go for a 15 minute run when you haven't been running all at once is going to be painful. It's just going to hurt things. SI joint hurts, ankles hurt, knees can hurt, like things just hurt uh, hips because it's just pounding that the body's not used to anymore. And no matter how good your form is, there's, there's impact a lot. And I find the only way to get a strong form running is to run. There's no, elliptical doesn't do it. You can't run, do elliptical. Running on a treadmill, I have to say, I think it's not, depending on the treadmill, it can be worse than running outside sometimes. So just being, not thinking that that's an easier route. Definitely running on dirt or track. Spring tracks are better than running on concrete. That will make them hurt less too. So just some things to think about, yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other thoughts? Do you think people can run health? Am I on? Am I on? Yeah. Do you think healthy 60 and 70 year old people should run or can run? I think there are some that can. I don't think they all can, right? I think um, I think a lot can work up to it, though. Believe it or not. Um, mm -hmm. So we there is. It just so when people get over 40 really and um, there it takes it starts taking a lot more time to build muscle and maintaining muscle takes work so versus gr growing up to being 40 mm -hmm. you don't really have to work to maintain muscles that you just do if you have them most of the time you maintain after 40 you start and depending on how far away from there you get um, obviously there's some variant but then you start to have to work to maintain muscle. So you're putting work in you're to maintain, but then, then you wanna get stronger. So you then have to put in more work to get stronger. So it just takes longer and more work to build strength. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what's interesting, um, and I'll have to look up the details of this again to give you exact, is that men and women have a second sort of peak of performance later. Um, and I think for women, it's like 56. And I think for men, it's even more, I think 60 something. So there's an interesting um, training that can happen uh, if you're training well, that you can actually have a physical peak again later. So it can be done. Um, and now you were asking about even older than that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think depends on history, right? So if they've had knee replacements and hip replacements, running is just not a good idea um, for the most part. If their joints have been healthy, like I, I can use my mom as an example. She didn't start really exercising very much until she was in her 50s. And she just got stronger and stronger and better and better. She, didn't, she never really wanted to run. But she could, she could hike and hike fast and she could jog if she needed to on the flats and be fine. And, and she didn't have any joint problems. So mm -hmm. uh, somebody who doesn't have joint problems, I think could be running later in life. Um, and it just takes more maintenance and more, more maintenance and more strength work. So more time to achieve the same results. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's, it's ironic because it's so good for bone density, building bones, that impact, but yeah, yes. it's hard to do. <laughs> so. Yes, it's hard to do. So some of the other things that are, I would call running type sports are like the Zumba classes, things like that. They're doing mm -hmm. a lot of jumping in those classes, jumping and dance, dance, jumping around. Um, there's, there's some dances that are like even ballroom, like jive, where you're bouncing and jumping a lot. Those I have, I've seen a lot of people in their older age be able to do that. And that's not different from running, really. It's still that same activity. It's just um, in a fixed, closer space, closed space. So, um, and they could rest when they want. So that might be a good option for people too. Hmm. rather than like thinking they need to go for a, the dipsy run but marin is amazing for hmm. that dipsy run and the people who do that dipsy run a lot of them are in their 70s it's amazing how many um people are still hmm. able to do it but it takes a, a lot of training yeah yeah jump board there's always jump board if you can get back to the studio <laughs> yeah <laughs> We have a client in her 70s who we improved her bone density. I would see her twice a week in one of those days for a year. We did jump board and she went yep. back and had her bone density done again and it improved um, enough so that she was, she was osteopenia and it got back up to being no longer osteopenia. Osteopenia, that's amazing. Yeah, you can reverse it. That's great. Yeah. 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 I mean, even though we have people in the studio now, just for rehab purposes, I haven't even thought about jumping because of having to wear the mask mm -hmm. and make and it just being too hard to breathe. But mm -hmm. I guess I could have them do those little tiny foot jumps like you did yesterday, Zaina, in the rehab mm -hmm. course. Yeah. Yeah, you could. With jumping crap. I've it's wearing a mask doing jump board they don't <laughs> it's not pleasant but they're you know it's not killing them either so they're okay with it okay oh, all right they make huh. yeah yeah i think jump board could be great and that's great to hear allison because there hasn't yeah. been any research on jump board and osteoporosis you um but it would be nice to like keep that information um because it as that's one way to start kind of researching is case study. Yep. So if you have, if you have her bone density report from before and after that year, I don't know, it'd be amazing to hold on to that information just because. I don't know if she gave me a copy, but um, I can ask her about it and see. Yeah, ask her about it and tell her, you know, this is great research for Pilates mm -hmm. um, efficacy to just have that information. And they're always trying to gather information on things like that. And, and I could put you in touch with Sherry Betts too. She does a lot for osteoporosis. She's on the Osteoporosis Foundation too. She'd probably love to be in touch with you about how, like having that distinct information. And so, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think jump wood we talked about as being a lighter version of running, which is nice. Um, it does a lot for strengthening, gets the heart rate up, um, and can help with that, that dynamic aspect is what we were talking about yesterday in the rehab class, we're talking about ankles. But having to reintroduce dynamic exercise for people who are going to be doing dynamic actions outside. So if a lot of our older clients play tennis, right, they have mm -hmm. to be able to be dynamic on their feet. And if they're, say they have an injury or they're just not great, they can tear those muscles if they're not used to the dynamic motion. So training them dynamically is a great key for their success as well. So the jump board's a great thing for that too, for that dynamic um, training of muscles. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, it would be great to kind of see how it goes if you guys work on walking, running, or have that in your head with your classes and stuff this week. Um, I'd love to know how that goes or what you come up with um, exercise-wise or what you think people get out of it. Well, Sometimes. I'll definitely, I'll definitely use that when I do the stretch and strength, strengthen and lengthen, mm -hmm. you know, stretching. I mean, I already do that already, but, you know, just pointing out the importance of the hip flexors and the quads and all of that for walking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And then the other piece that we didn't really talk about is in order to walk or run effectively, you have to have enough trunk stability, right? So if this can't hold steady for your legs to swing underneath it, then you get a distorted gait or stride also, right? So that would be, you know those people whose pelvis has to move for their legs to move, they can't hold the torso steady to allow the legs to move underneath them. So those people, they'll either have this kind of, you know, the hips swaying or they'll have the hips tucking every time their legs go forward. So working on trunk stability and emphasizing neutral position while they're laying down or kneeling work in neutral, you can do some standing work in neutral, but emphasizing the fact that we have to be able to hold this steady to have a stable base to move on, on off of, right? The legs need a stable base. Otherwise, how, how can they really go and be in good alignment and good form and give you the best efficient motion? You're gonna lose a lot if that base is not stable. So that's something to also be thinking about this week on um, really trying to stabilize people in different positions with different motions and allow the legs to move underneath them. So all the like standing leg kick exercises um, are really good. Maybe even doing standing leg circles or standing leg tapping in all directions, trying to hold steady through the center while they're doing it. Um, even standing, moving arms around or standing, holding steady with a little side bending work, you know, just to keep, understand that this has to hold so we can move off of something stable. So that's the other piece to think about. More true with running than walking, but definitely still true with walking. All right. That's all I can think of. Thank you, Zaina. <laughs> You're welcome, you guys. Thank you.